So oh. we were pretty into grad school. And he's done a lot of excellent work in that original project, the Miller project, and actually he's doing quite his own science on things and several projects through literacy in a broader sense for uh, understanding the natural things like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, so um, the talk today, essentially, um, John gave a nice introduction. So as you would have sensed, um, it would be about uh, games and games for language learning. Um, and in my time here at Berkeley, I have specifically looked at uh, sort of spoken language technology. Um, so most of the talk will be about speech enabled games. Um, but John mentioned this project in India, which sort of forms the motivation of the work that we've been doing here at Berkeley. Um, so I'm going to talk about that project first and um, sort of set up the motivation for the work that we've done. And then there are two specific projects that we're going to um, talk about. One of them deals with pronunciation feedback um, through games, and the other one is basically a conversational agent that we have developed, which plays a question answering game with these students. And um, obviously, we'll talk about studies that we did to evaluate these systems. Um, so I essentially uh, dedicated my dissertation research to investigating like, a single research topic in a variety of different contexts. Um, and that research question is, can we design speech-enabled LinkedIn environments that can support um, And when, we, when I say a variety of contexts, um, I'm, I'm talking about things that are very specific. So we've explored that particular research question in, um, in sort of like two major contexts, which is pronunciation feedback and question answering. And those are essentially the two projects that you're going to be talking about uh, today. But a major part of sort of investigating this research question is to investigate how. So not only can, how do we design these systems? So it's also about the process. Like how do you start coming with the research question till you actually have a functional system that actually works from this problem. That's essentially the structure of what we're talking about. Um, so as I said, setting up the motivation for this work a little bit, the motivation actually comes from this project called MILI. Um, MILI stands for Mobile and Immersive Learning for the Tracing and Emerging Economy. It's a project that I started working on as an undergrad and continued to work on through like my first few years in grad school. Um, but before we delve into the sort of the details of the project and what it did, Let's look at the challenge that actually exists in the development region. Um, and we're specifically talking about India. So literacy in the powered language or the language of the service economy is important. Um, I think almost everybody in the room should probably be aware of that. Um, but due to lack of resources, it's really hard to achieve um, uh, reasonable levels of proficiency in English, um, especially for kids who are trying to acquire English in the second um, and in fact, the value of English is widely recognized by ordinary Indians. And in fact, it is the poorest citizens of, of, of India who actually lobby the most strongly for like, learning and for expanding English teaching in schools. Um, however, for very complex reasons, um, English teaching doesn't quite succeed in public schools. Um, this is, of course, because of a variety of different reasons, but some of the ones that we have a hold on and that have been documented in the research are things like irregular school attendance or you know the level of proficiency in English for the teachers who are teaching the language. All those factors sort of add up to a complex situation where it's really hard to acquire English as a second language. So given, given that this challenge that existed in terms of um, learning English as a second language, it was, it was also clear that there is a growing opportunity when we we're sort of trying to investigate really initially studies, it was clear that there is this opportunity in terms of increasing cell phone usage in, in developing regions, specifically in India. In fact, India is actually the largest market for cell phones, with majority of cell phones being bought by illiterate or semi-literate users. So as a part of Mili, our solution was to design cell phone games for language learning. And working towards this goal, we, we basically followed a human-centered design process in which we consulted experienced local teachers uh, on our instruction and game design. And in fact, we tested these games out with multiple communities in North and South India. Um, and by field testing with multiple communities, we observed um, behaviors with technology that could generalize across settings. Um, something interesting that we found was that games that are modeled uh, 
um, around traditional like village games that kids play in their daily life tend to work better than uh, games that you know derive from more foreign design patterns or design patterns that are unfamiliar to the children. Um, and in fact, our end product was, as I mentioned before, it was much more about the process. So the end product was not necessarily these games. Of course, there were the games, but then there was this process of how we sort of started from like, this problem that we were trying to address and how did we move to the that we were trying to design. So when so once I started. Um, here, I, I wanted to explore um, if the same sort of set of processes or the, or the same sort of questions that we were trying to investigate in solutions to them essentially would help us design games for certain contexts and certain situations here in the US. Um, and that is what the rest of the talk will be about. So we've sort of taken the same set of design, design guidelines and principles and tried to apply them to two distinct contexts within the US. And the rest of the talk will essentially talk about what those two projects were and what we see. Um, it's a little end heavy. We'll talk more about the conversational agent um, than the pronunciation feedback work, but I'll give you a flavor of the kind of results that we saw during the pronunciation feedback. Um, so it's always good to set up the context. So set, setting up the context for the pronunciation feedback work. Um, here is some um, sort of quantitative data from some official reports. This is actually taken from the from the report by the Policy Institute from 2010. Um, and it, it says that um, there are, of course, uh, a lot of uh, people from Hispanic backgrounds who, who live in the US. And approximately 6% um, of the total population, population is from Mexican origin, which is around 13, 13 and a half million. Um, the report actually says, uh, says that Spanish speaking immigrant population, almost twice likely to live in poverty, much higher compared to any other immigrant. Um, something that I do want to mention here as an aside is that there is no unidimensional solution to poverty. Of course, everybody knows that. But I think literacy and proficiency in a power language or language of the service economy is an important part of that solution, and that is where we are trying to essentially come. Um, so, just like India, there are problems in learning English over here as well. During some initial surveys and some demographic interviews that we conducted in in the part we at this high school. Um, we realized that even though the importance of English is clear to most people, the opportunity for practice and use are very limited. Um, because most of the kids that we talked to, and even when we were talking to there's something that they mentioned was that most of these kids live in sort of um, very like Spanish speaking sort of communities and households, so they don't get practice with English, and which is critical to learning, learning or acquiring a new language. Um, and something that they generally tend to struggle with is uh, is pronunciation and vocabulary acquisition. So those are sort of the two major areas um, which where they struggle. And um, we feel that pronunciations can essentially be the problem with pronunciations can be rectified by sort of active oral exposure. And that is where this particular project was trying to contribute. Basically. Um, Developing an environment where we, were ba we can basically use age appropriate games that are maybe similar to the ones that children already play, um, and using them as aids to do pronunciation feedback and sort of helping them with improving pronunciation. Um, something that I, that I should make clear here is that we are not trying to remove accents. It's fine to have accents, I have one. Um, but the point was to help children with intelligibility in speech. So if, if, if they're pronouncing certain words uh, in a way that is unclear or cannot be understood, we were basically trying to move them to a stage where they have better intelligible speech in terms of So um, towards that goal, um, we went through a whole bunch of phases. We did some demographic interviews. Earlier, I sort of mentioned them uh, in my conversation up until now. Um, after the demographic interviews, we sort of had an understanding of the kind of games that they uh, enjoy playing, the kind of technology use that the kids have. Um, and then we sort of designed the games, developed the games, did an experiment to evaluate and see how much these games can help them with pronunciation. And then once we had that data, we did some further sort of linguistic um, analysis and optimization for this one. Um, so uh, the, the, the demographic interviews essentially helped us get a hold on the gaming preferences and behavior. Um, it was evident 
from the interviews that certain types of games are more preferable than others. Um, and the games that we actually eventually decided to build were based on two famous games almost everybody in the room must have heard about them. One was Mario and the other one was Guitar Hero. Um, both like very popular games, games that we saw, uh, we sort of realized that almost everybody in our program uh, uh, have had prior exposure with. And it's a game design that they like or enjoy. Um, so the basic game design remained very similar, but we modified the original game to sort of include pedagogy. Um, this concept was again borrowed from me. Um, but at this point, you must be curious what the games look like. So I'll do a very quick um, sort of video of the Guitar Hero game um, so that you have a sense of how it behaved and like how the pronunciation feedback worked. The demo is actually of me playing with the game, and I deliberately mispronounced certain things so that it can point that, point that out to us. So let's take a look at the video. It's too bright. Shelter. But you pronounce the word and then it gives you feedback on how you're how you're pronouncing like each individual phonetic unit of it. I deliberately pronounce it as college. And it would sort of written that particular part of it. If you say something completely bizarre, it sort of spots that as well. I, yeah. I say random instead of shelter. Um, but the point is to basically sort of actively monitor speech that is coming in and, and sort of using that to give color coded feedback on how they are you know, going wrong or going right in cert on certain parts of it. And once they keep doing that over a sort of a period of time, we did see improvements in the like quickly look at the results. Um, so, how does it work? Um, for the purpose of speech recognition, we actually use the CMU Sphinx speech recognition engine. But instead of using it in recognition mode, we use it in forced alignment mode. Um, for those of you who do not know what forced alignment is, uh, so recognizer basically generally does a search, right? So in forced alignment, you already tell the recognizer that this is the word that you're expecting, and then just aligns it to the particular transcript that you're expecting and gives you results on each individual sort of phonetic unit. Um, and the feedback team uh, basically did the job of rating the quality of each phonetic unit. And the way we did that, that was that we had like a model for each phonetic unit. There were like 40 phones in the English phone set. So for each phone, um, we had a normal distribution presenting the range in which the scores for that particular phone could lie. And that distribution was created using the C database, which is a meeting of, which is a database of uh, meeting recordings from uh, from basically meetings that happened at C C um, So in terms of the scale of the data, we basically had overall had like 300 k phones overall, which amounts to on an average eight in eight k instances of each phone. So that's the amount of data that we were using to sort of create um, these distributions that we were sort of aligning the incomes to. Um, so using using this, we essentially uh, generated these confidence scores that our game was using to sort of change the change, uh, sort of give you the feedback and change gameplay. Um, when I say change gameplay, I essentially mean that we were using a specific algorithm. It's called graduated interval default. Um, it's an algorithm that is used by the Pimsleur series of software, and it's a it's a known algorithm that is supposed to help you with retention. And what it does is that it basically it basically tells you the choice of the, if you have a syllabus, and it basically tells you what is the next syllabus item that you should choose to you know, so, sort of teach. And it's based on how often you've gone wrong on that particular syllabus item. So in this particular case, if you pronounce like you know, most of the phones in the word P um, wrongly, it would probably show up more often in, in our game. So that, that is how it works. If you're doing well on a word, it would show up less often. So that's essentially the point. Um, did we evaluate it? Of course we did. Um, so we did a study at this uh, high school that I was talking about in Menlo Park. Um, and uh, it was sort of a very standard experiment setup. We had like two groups of people in an experiment group and we went through three stages. We did a pre-test to sort of get a hold on um, sort of the English, like, English baselines that um, kids have. We did our intervention, um, which was I think a month. Uh, lasted around four weeks. 
and then we did a post test to sort of see how much how much change we had to um, And of course, there were two games uh, based on Mario and Guitar Hero that alternated, and approximately overall, uh, the kids got uh, around 40 minutes of gameplay time during our study. Um, as I mentioned, the study setup was simple. It was like 20 students. I think we had some attrition. Two students left the program midway, so we did not include them into the analysis. Um, so we had a total of 18 students and nine, nine per, per the both groups, essentially. Um, and the point of the experiment was to demonstrate value to out of school or out of class learning. So that is how we had the experiment model that there were both the groups were receiving regular classroom instruction, but then one of the groups also had the opportunity to play games along with uh, sort of the transition feedback. And then at the end of the study, we tried to monitor how much change we have got. Um, so I'm not going to throw numbers at you. Um, just take my word for it. There was gain in uh, uh, there was gain in acoustic quality and uh, the number of words that they were comfortable in terms of Pronounce it. If you want the numbers, of course, we've published this. Um, you can look at the numbers that we published. Um, and by when I when I mention acoustic quality, there was a specific metric that we were measuring. Um, we were sort of measuring change in the percentage change in the acoustic score that was happening from the test to the post test. So the num so the words that we were teaching during the experiment, we could we sort of made the kids pronounce those words at the start of the experiment and at the end of the experiment. And then we sort of saw if they can pronounce the words in the at the end of the experiment. And by the number of words, um, I essentially mean that um, a part of the uh, motivation for this project was also you know, motivation to talk and motivation to speak in English, right? So when I say number of words, I essentially mean that there were some words in the syllabus that they were too unsure of when the study started. They would not even pronounce it. Um, but by the, by the time the study ended, they were saying more words. Uh, but they were more comfortable pronouncing pronouncing certain words or attempting to pronounce certain words than they were at the start. So that's what we mean by um, There were some like interesting and unexpected results. Gender didn't seem to play a role. It wasn't like at least quantitatively speaking that seemed to play a role. <coughs> uh, we might have to take for that. Uh, pre existing knowledge wasn't a factor since we had a hold on um, the pre test scores to sort of try to see its correlation with the final scores that we saw as well. And it did not seem like someone who had more knowledge learned more. It, it, it almost seemed like everybody in the program was learning in the same sort of thing. They were moving from, um, uh, in terms of intelligibility of speech, they were sort of moving to approximately the same space. Um, on the way forward from the study, uh, we also hired two linguistics, uh, two linguists from the uh, Department of Linguistics, Linguistics here at Berkeley, and we sort of made sure um, that they give Likert scale readings to the pre-test and post-test scores um, based on their own metrics, so that we also get a hold on. Uh, uh, we were of course measuring all the results computationally so far, so right, all the all our metrics were computational. We also wanted to see if, from a linguistic standpoint, are we causing any change, and it turned out that we were. Um, and one of the sort of the deliverables or the output of our um, sort of work was this pronunciation evaluation of feedback library that we could essentially supply, you know, an output from a post alignment routine, and it would give you sort of you know scores for individual phonetic units between zero and one. So potentially, it could be used by other um, sort of you know research activity that is that trying to build games for this particular context. And as a matter of fact, it has been. So there is this project at CMU which is called Smart, and it um, sort of helps people with uh, uh, word reading. Um, the context of the project is in India, but it uses in terms of the feedback and in terms of like evaluating the internal sort of you know phonetic breakup of, of, of the words and giving feedback in terms of you know pronunciation. It is using most of the code that we had, you know, developed for Spring. Um, and again, there is a paper on that in um, last year's Sky. Uh, if you want to look up the details on that project, but the context of that project is in India, and I'm not the lead on that. So I didn't want to talk. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the story of Spring. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, moving to the sort of the second part of the work that I've done here with John. Um, we've basically been exploring how to build question answering agent for, for preschoolers. Um, again, as I said, it's always good to motivate what you do. Um, so let's take a look at uh, a little bit at the motivation behind the project. 
Um, so a large body of research, actually, um, and some of you might be aware of this, has shown that literacy gap between children is actually well established before formal schooling begins. Um, and it actually predicts academic performance um, through primary, middle, and secondary school. Um, and in fact, rather than closing this gap, there is also evidence that formal schooling sort of exacerbates it. Um, and actually, once a, a child is behind in terms of like reading and vocabulary, children tend to learn with like lower comp comprehension and you know, turn to learn, learn more slowly than their language able to learn. Um, in fact, many national organizations like the like NELP, um, which is basically the National Early Literacy Panel, the National Center for Family Literacy, they have they sort of outlined the essential role of literacy in a child's later education and academic opportunity. Um, but these these sound like claims. Do we have do we have, do we have data to support this? Right? Does it actually happen? Um, as a matter of fact, we do. Um, these graphs are actually taken from this book, book by uh, Hart and Risley. The book is called Meaningful Differences in Lives of Young American Children. Um, they actually show how language exposure and language growth um, tend to vary across different segments of the society. Um, so as a part of this study, the researchers visited, I think it was 42, 42 families um, and sort of recorded an hour of parent-child interactions. And they were looking for things like how much do parents praise their children, what they talk about, you know, um, whether the conversational tone is positive or negative. So all these features in language. Um, then they waited for six years, and why, during this time they sort of transcribed everything that they had recorded. And they, at the end of these six years, they monitored how these kids were doing by the time they were aging. Um, again, uh, uh, something on the side and something that I want to make clear is that. Hart and Grizzly, even in their book, book, don't try to necessarily argue that socioeconomic status is a predictor or, or has a direct correlation with language exposure or growth. I think the point of these graphs is to shed light on the relationship between the amount of language exposure that you get in your first few years of life and the kind of growth of language that you show in the first few years. Um, the only question is, does this, does this sort of disparity balance out in the long run and do we have data to support it. Um, so what so the same book also reports data on things that happen like later in the later in the lives of these kids that I think recruited. Um, so Hart and Grizzly actually recruit 29 out of the 42 families that we saw in the last slide. And they sort of tried to do e-body picture vocabulary tests and test of language development at the age nine and then try to see uh, the correlation between them. Um, and it is clear from the graphs that the correlation is reasonably strong. And once behind in these competencies by the uh, age of three, a child tends to stay behind. Um, so at this point, the questions that we can ask essentially are, can technology play a role here? Um, given that there is importance in early child literacy, um, is, is there something that technology could you know, assist in? And what could be a good tool or what could be a good carrier for this technology? We believe that it could be question answering because it turns out that children ask lots of questions. Um, so, and, and in fact, they're naturally primed to do so. Um, and as a matter of fact, it has been supported by a lot of research that questions are an essential part of language development. And they provide um, sort of primary experience and exposure with things like question construction, <coughs> statement construction, complex tenses. So they seem like a good carrier or a good tool on which you could base a technology like this. Um, and uh, as, I, as I already mentioned, like unlike other forms of interaction like reading or games or you know, storytelling or things like that, there is, there is essentially no external influence required to sort of garner a child's interest or build motivation to ask questions. Because whenever there is a mismatch between what they know and what they see, they'll ask a the question. Um, and it's actually an efficient tool in terms of you know the distance that they travel in their sort of zone of proximal development. Uh, for people who do not know what the zone of proximal development is, it's actually the distance between your actual development level, not your <laughs> child's actual development level, and the level of potential development under Edward's guide. Um, so yeah, so far so good. But what is the solution that we propose? Um, so our envisioned solution essentially involves having a talking toy or a real world artifact that engages preschoolers in a conversation. So in this scenario, the toy uses a projector to project in the child's environment. 
and engages a, a child in a follow-up uh, question answering sequence. Uh, the toy can essentially proceed through like carefully designed activities that gives hints and you know, sort of scaffold this process and walk them through like a, some sort of a game, like maybe 20 questions. <clears throat> and we feel that the processing of question and generation of response could potentially happen in the cloud. Um, such a toy could actually do more than question answering, but this was sort of you know, the first um, thing that we explored. Um, it seems like we are making a whole bunch of assumptions in terms of the design that this particular system could have. We are using we are using a projection system, but there but there is value to projection systems, and there is a lot of research in the recent past which basically looks at things like video play spaces, and there is a whole bunch of work that Cody and Ben have done at Microsoft Research, which looks at using projection systems and sort of trying to engage children in conversations. Uh, so that's our vision. Um, what did our realization of this vision look like? So I'll actually try to do a demo video on the next slide. But before I do, a, and that's actually a video of our final system. And then the rest of the story will be in flashback. So we'll basically explain how did we get to that system. Um, and the system is essentially completely automated, but it uses my voice. So bear with me, because I, I'm for deeper purposes, I was just using my voice. But let's take a look at uh, sort of um, at, at a trial that Spot does uh, with the child and how it works. Are you going to choose one of these things and hide it in a box? I hid it one of the things in the box. It's your turn to figure out what's in the box. Go ahead, ask me a question. Does it have to be? Yes, that's a great question. Keep going. <laughs> Go ahead, ask me a question. Do you find it in the garden? No, that's a great question. So it has pages Keep and going. you don't find it. You're doing really well. Go ahead. Ask me a question. Is it the book? That's a good guess. Let's open up the box and see if you're right. That was a lot of fun. Thank you for playing my favorite game. Let's play again. So yeah, that gives you a sense of uh, kind of the activity that we built. Like it introduces two objects. Um, we've simplified the game. Of course, it's uh, it's technically 20 questions, but we've simplified it in the sense that you only have two objects at hand at any point of time. We had to do that to sort of cater to the needs of uh, the preschoolers that we were working with. Um, and you essentially ask questions to sort of distinguish between the two objects. So as you saw in the example, I ask things like, does it have pages, which would tell me if it's a book. And then I ask, do you, do you find it in the garden, which would tell me if it's a, if it's a rose. Um, and then based on that, you know, I would decide like what it is, and then it would review. Um, so it was a simple game of review. How did we get there? Um, we went through a whole bunch of phases. We did a feasibility study um, where we did not even use technology. I'll talk about it. Um, then we designed the system, did a wizard of Oz experiment, and then we moved towards an automated system. The automated system actually is installed in the room, and after the talk, the talk you could potentially go and talk to it. I'll talk about that later. Um, so for the feasibility study, um, we were trying to explore certain questions that you would always have when you were trying to build a system of this sort for a preschooler. And those were, are, are the interactions predictable? Are they deterministic? And you know, when you ground them in an activity like 20 questions. And, is the repair that are involved in like such a dialogue? Is it is it feasible? Is it limited? Or do they like tend to go move away from the from the from the conversation? Um, and how far can we sort of effectively you know work with these students and sort of help them with solving problems? And how far do they move away from this activity? So towards that end, we actually worked at the Child Study Center, which is actually a free school on the south side of the town. Um, I can see Laura smiling because that's where. Her child was, um, and uh, so our participants were essentially ten males and um, ten females um, between the ages of four and five. Um, and in a typical session, it was very similar to the uh, to, to sort of the video you saw. Like it was actually a real world version of it. So when they would come into the room and we go through go through multiple trials, 
of us showing them two images and then like shuffling them around, hiding one, and keeping one on the table, and then asking us questions about like which one it is. Um, so uh, to so, sort of the same structure uh, to the activity as the as the video that you saw, um, and a demo trial was done to sort of give them an understanding of how a particular session works, um, and then if they did not, yeah, go ahead. Oh, so um, so in the in the video, like when it started, you already had two objects straight, right? Yeah. So they, yeah, yeah. So I mean, in the, when you actually talk to the game, um, you you essentially say game to sort of see the two objects, and then you say start. So um, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no, that's a fair question and a question that I've often gotten, um, even from the people at the preschool. Um, but if you, it turned out that if you sort of instruct, the point of the activity was to sort of, uh, sort of play the game, right? And if you instruct them that this is a game where you sort of ask ask questions about the parts, functions, properties of objects, generally they would abide by it. And, not, and once you, I did not recall a case where we mentioned that you know sometimes they would try to ask the actual object itself. But if you tell them that this is a game where you know you sort of figure out which object it is, and it will be more fun that way, and you can talk to Spot more um, that way, <laughs> generally they would sort of abide by that. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, and uh, where was I? Yeah, so I mean, we, we did this study. Of course, we like sort of recorded the videos, transcribed and analyzed everything, and um, sort of to give you a flavor of the results that we saw. Um, children asked questions, a lot of them actually. Um, they asked more than 200 questions uh, um, during the time we were, we were working with them, like, of course, across the 20 kids that we were working with. Um, the ones who asked more solved more, so they got through. That the ones who asked more questions sort of got through more prob more problems. Questions actually had specific categories. Most of the questions actually were sort of about parts of objects, or functions of objects, or properties of objects. So there was like a structure to the types of questions that they would ask. Um, this actually agrees with prior research on um, sort of child development and essentially research on question question answering that uh, that couldn't do. Um, this activity actually was also borrowed from that kind of research. Like um, people in that in this particular domain have used this activity of twenty questions a lot to sort of study the kind of questions that kids ask in, this, in these scenarios. Um, there was uh, this was actually an interesting finding and very important one. There was actually a limited tendency to go away from the activity at hand, and they there was like sort of limited need for explanation. We did not have to give like repeated explanation once you. Sort of explained the activity, and once they had a realistic understanding of the activity, um, it was um, it was <coughs> it was under our control essentially. Um, as I said, off-topic dialogues were limited; like only five percent, approximately, of the total sort of utterances that they were um, that we that we transcribed were actually something that was not related to the topic, um, which is which is pretty impressive. Which means that they were um, they were sort of focused on the. Um, so once we had done the feasibility study and it was sort of pointing in positive directions, we started building the agent. Um, and while we were building the agent, we sort of um, tried to make sure that we sort of derive or use the sort of basic or uh, like the standard methods that parents use in terms of you know talk to, talking to children. There, are, there there is sort of some work on that as well. So we were using some of that dialogue theory to design our agent. Um, and the point was to explore if we can design such an agent. And we can engage uh, kids in, in, in such an activity. So in terms of the um, interface, uh, to create uh, sort of an engaging experience with minimal effort, we use this technique called Machinima. Um, Machinima is actually a process of using in-game recording facilities to record segments of game action, uh, which can be under like the higher level control of However, we actually modified that concept a little bit. Machinima is actually supposed to be linear, so you essentially record a movie. But what you were, what you probably noticed from the demo was actually um, that it was it was videos, but it was being controlled by a script. So based on what the child is saying or based on where he is in a particular game, you would choose a video to play. So it was like sort of 
script controlled non linear machine um, the game actually mimic the sort of the feasibility uh, study it would uh, this probably sort of sheds some light on your question right so it would actually it would sort of show the two objects and then like sort of convert them into question marks and then shuffle it around I I that's how the the, the game works in terms of putting the system together um, obviously it needs to have uh, when you talk about the dialogue system as a whole of course it needs to have a speech recognition component to it natural language understanding and the basic agent logic to essentially send commands to the agent based on what is happening over here and then it would respond in terms of like gestures and speech um, and gestures and speech actually have mappings to each other which we're going to talk about in the couple of slides but for the purpose of the next phase of the study we deserted this part of the system so i was the one who would like listen to what they're saying and then i would send the command to the agent um, agent logic and then it would respond to um and as i said there were sort of mappings between the speech and gestures spot was capable of a uh, whole bunch of gestures i'll let that slide for So it could do a whole bunch of things. It used um, primarily two types of gestures. Um, so iconic gestures. Um, as in, they essentially mean, you know, object attributes or spatial relationships or sort of actions that Spot could use to denote certain things. And Spot mostly used iconic gestures to say things like yes and no. You might have seen in the video that when it says no, it shakes its head, it says yes, and nods, or either jumps or something like that. Uh, when it was a right or a wrong guess, it would again use iconic gestures to sort of denote that. Um, um, in terms of dialectic gestures, when it was uh, spot was sort of uh, showing like what are the two objects in the front of question, it used pointing and sort of looked at the two objects. Use some dialectic gestures. We use speech bubbles throughout the game to denote talking um, because that was sort of very explicit and make sure that the kid knows that spot spot is not right now. Um, and in terms of the speech or the dialogue design, spot had a sorry yeah. Did you intentionally design such an enthusiastic job as you think it should have handed you that There were there were versions of I mean you, it's it's the sim specs creator tool. Um, so there are versions of a sort of a more you know calm down dog there, but it seemed like you know that level of energy and that level of sort of animation was was good to sort of engage them. I mean, if you play something like that on the screen, and they're actually essentially seeing the projection, um, and to to, be, to make sure that it sort of captures their attention, um, it was important that we you know the characters animate. But we did try out sort of other versions of it, uh, but this is the one that we sort of. Did. I could see initially it would be exciting, but I would think, you know, if, 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 if you just were fairly young, then you know, uh, you know, it could be, but I mean, um, we haven't seen um, sort. Of, we haven't sort of like you know deployed the system over you know a long period of time. It could be the case that over a long period of time, you know, things else. But at this point of time, given my current understanding, I don't have. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of the uh, sort of the speech or the dialogue that Spot did. It sort of did again. Like we went, uh, we went back to the original sort of you know where from where our motivation came. Um, so that book actually is a good source of you know information about you know how how preschoolers talk to their parents and how preschoolers talk in general. Um, and it seemed like um, parents use a lot of sort of discourse functions in simple language. Discourse functions are things are basically categorization of utterances in terms of the response that they can extract. And parents use a lot of sort of rules and questions and demands to sort of do that. There are like multiple levels to like discourse, discourse functions, and Spot incorporated all of them. I have put examples on the side of the concept so that you know exactly what it means. And something that parents also use are age of adjacency conditions. Again, these are a categorization of sort of a sequence of utterance in a in an interaction. So Spot. Spot did um, some of like sort of close holding whenever there was like a like a pause in the uh, in the in the, uh, in, the part, in the conversation. It would say something to sort of you know grab the child's attention back into the activity, and sort of um, There is, I mean, a, an important component of when you talk to kids uh, is also balance and the emotional tone that you give to the conversation. So Spot tried to do that as well. It might have been a little bit clear from the demo video that we played. 
um, um, I recorded the even for my voices, I recorded uh, the same way uh, which they need to be doing the study. So it had like sort of you know emotional tone to it. And Spot used a lot of sort of hints and redirections. So whenever there was there would be like a sort of a long period of pause, we would generally give um, hints to sort of draw them back into the activity. You know things like how do you tell between the two objects? How do you tell between book, book and rows and things like that? So that they come back to the activity and start asking questions again. So we experimented with these sort of parameters for bunch. Um, and as I as I mentioned, there were of course like sort of mappings between gestures and speech. So for, for some of them you already saw in the in the demo that we played. Um, uh, when when Spot was idle, he would like sort of you know speak or look around or something like that. But for yes and no, he could like nod or say no. For guess it would jump around. For a for a bad guess it would turn shy and step back a little bit. So but but gestures are a good way to sort of denote what is going going on in the game. That is what we realized. Um, so we made sure that spot is animated as much as we can. Yeah. Um, so for the wizard of our study, um, the setup was very same, very similar to the feasibility study, except that we had two conditions now. So there was a human condition where they would play the game with us. And then there was the agent condition where they would play the game with the wizard and spot. So we, we would listen to whatever they were saying and we would send in commands respond to what they were saying. Um, so the and of course the human condition was identical to the feasibility study because they were essentially playing the game with us. Um, but the set of objects that they were trying to play with was different from the feasibility study because we sort of you know wanted them to have like a fresh new set of objects so that we can Render the two cases um, compared. Um, in terms of the results that we saw, the reds are um, sort of the numbers for the agent condition, and the blues are the numbers for the human condition. They're kind of interesting, actually. Um, the ones that are sort of circle, well, not circle, but like you know, ellipse in green, <laughs> um, are the ones where we saw significance. So it turns out that they were asking like more questions in the agent condition, but I feel that some of it could be attributed to sort of novelty factor. They were only playing with spot for like a for like a 20 minute or a 30 minute duration. And they were seeing this character or this setup for the first time. So you could potentially argue that you know novelty is a is a factor there. But something that something that it definitely points to is that we were able to create an experience that was engaging and they were they were able to solve questions along with spot as um, these numbers might go down if you sort of keep using the system uh, over a longer period of time, but it definitely uh, points in the right direction. Um, in terms of the sort of the subjective experience, I wanted to share some of the you know uh, things that were recorded while they were playing the game. Um, there, these two actually come from the same child. There was a child who was who was basically saying that he would do whatever spot asks him to do, so he yes. like really engage in the activity. He was like, he didn't want to quit, kept, kept on saying that, hey, he asked. So at the end of the session, right, Scott generally says, let's play again. Um, and that was his cue. He would say, if he says, let's play again, I'm going to play again. Um, <laughs> so he just kept kept on playing. Um, and I also wanted to share some of like the brilliant questions that we saw. They're actually all from the agent condition. Um, there was this child who was trying to distinguish, I think it was between a car and a bike. And I think he asked, does it have a wheel that's inside of it? And he's, uh, he's trying to ask about the steering wheel. Um, and I think that's a brilliant question. And it, it, like, since I was listening to it, it took me a while to sort of understand what he's asking. But then I was like, oh, steering wheel, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think this one was for, uh, I might be walking through. So does it have a skin you can eat? I think that this question came in for like when they were trying to distinguish between orange and apple. And for an orange, you arguably do not eat this thing. Um, and that is the question that they asked. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. So they were. You can make a distinguish the context within the category of the actual question, but the actual question in the category is simpler than other kinds. That's true. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it was definitely simple. It was, I mean, the response of the system was in terms of yes and no. Um, so it was definitely simplified in that sense. You could probably have, not probably, you do, you can have like much more sort of complex question answering structures. 
Um, but since that was sort of a vehicle that was you know simple enough, we thought that we could expect that as. Um, and yeah, I mean, one kid was also like really smart about it because he asked something like, does it start with a W? He did not know what to ask for a watch and a clock because they're very similar to each other. So he said, does it start with a W? And I think that was a brilliant question to be able to think about that. Um, so moving towards the sort of the uh, automated system, um, we removed the wizard of course, and then we used the Google speech recognition for um, sort of the speech recognition component of it, and then since we had data from the wizard of Oz study and the feasibility study, we sort of con we constructed like some representation of the knowledge, and that's what our natural language understanding is sort of there. In terms of the language processing, there were sort of two major components to it. There was the question analysis, and there was the question answering part of it. Um, so the way we analyze the question is that we sort of remove all the words or the filler words and the prepositions from it from the incoming um, sort of patterns. Um, and then we sort of extract the content. Uh, and then that content is basically sent to this. It, it is basically used as a query into an XML. And that XML has been constructed from intuitions from the wizard of Oz and the feasible study. Uh, we match the content using edit distance so that uh, sort of properties that are close to each other are matched as the same. Um, so if the content that is extracted maybe it was bounds, we treat it as the same as bouncy. So if you had bounds in your XML and you could send in bouncy, it would still be resolved because we are using edit distance of different, you know, the incoming property and what you can um, We also counted negations, so Spot can handle negations. Um, and uh, if, if they did a uh, if they did a direct yes, we basically would just review that. So if they if they directly asked about one of the uh, as we saw in the video when I asked, is it a is it a book? Um, and we of course did like edge case handling for 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 things that were said um, that were off topic. Um, in terms of the practical application, I've already mentioned that we were using XML um, that was queried with the property invocation that was extracted from the question. If the op if the incoming question matched with like any of the two objects properties. Um, then it would return a yes or no response. If there was no match, then it would be handled as an edge case. But even in edge case, we had levels. So if the if the incoming question doesn't get resolved, but it is actually a question, it could be the case that it is getting misrecognized by the recognition component. So we basically ask the user to repeat. So they, they would be asked to like either repeat the question or ask a different question if there is like if there are multiple. Questions. And we try to. We currently try to break loops, so if the if the conversation sort of goes into this loop where we are asking them to on and on and on, sort of repeat the question, we eventually give a hint, or if it's like completely breaking down, we switch to the next question. So that has already been built. Um, did we evaluate it? Um, so we treated, uh, we actually did. We treated our sort of the audio recordings of the data that we have from the Wizard of Oz as our goal data. Um, and we evaluated our system in the sense that if we are able to produce the same response as was produced during the Wizard of Oz study, it is a perfect match. Um, otherwise, it's not. Um, and we sort of investigated two cases there. So we sort of supplied the perfect transcript to our natural language understanding routine. And, it, and we just saw like 6%. In 6% cases, we would still go wrong. If we use the Google speech to sort of you know, transcribe children's voices and, that, and run that tool, um, this, uh, the natural language understanding routine, we only went on in. But even in speech recognition errors, speech recognition errors are fairly predictable. Uh, and some of them are happening because of terms that kids use. For example, Google speech recognition would not understand meow or point. But there are things that you know kids would ask when they are trying to you know, ask something about a pig or something about a cat. So you could essentially build a sort of some sort of an error lookup table. Um, which could resolve some of those queries, and we actually ended up doing that, and that that just sort of made our errors go down by. Um, I sort of mentioned this already, so they could ask things that are more colloquial, so that was already handled by our error tables. Um, something that they use fairly often is a location attribute. They would ask things like, "Do you property on your location?" Um, and we've sort of uh, sort of incorporated some of those, like for the ones that we've already seen. The Wizard of Oz, it is 
some of them. Sometimes they can use a complicated location like you see there. Can you pedal it to the library? And library is very specific. Um, and I mean, you can sort of incorporate those unique cases, but if it's a more complicated case, our system will probably still not be able to resolve it. Sometimes they, sometimes there is just not enough context in what they're saying. Sometimes they can just say a hat, a ball. It could potentially be a guess, but there is just not much in that particular statement for it to be able to um, sort of resolve. So we still have to work around those things. Um, so in conclusion, um, I think context and pre-knowledge helped us a lot in building the automated system. Like uh, once we had done the feasibility study and the visit of our study, we had this data that sort of built the automated system on. So having a pre-understanding of things that, uh, or the kind of framing that kids could give to a particular question sort of helped us. I think simplicity in the long language that they use and in sort of the knowledge structures that they have actually add to the feasibility of the system. And that is something that I had not been before I started because I felt that it would be hard, but it's actually easier because they frame their questions in very simple language, something that Google speech can easily understand. Um, and that sort of worked out in our advantage. Um, I felt that they were fairly fault tolerant with technology. Like whenever like something would put, I mean, there would be times when I would not understand their question and would like accidentally send in like the, like, the wrong response and they would still be fairly fault tolerant and would just keep like, um, And it was, uh, it was interesting to see that they actually uh, have a fairly realistic, I've already sort of mentioned that while I was answering these questions, um, but they have a fairly realistic understanding of the agent's capability and the kind of structure, like once you explain the activity to them. I mean, it could be the case that these kids that we're working with are already part of a, an, an environment where research activities keep on happening. So maybe they're just used to sort of, you know, getting instructions and, you know, abiding by them. <laughs> um, so it could be a typical case, but um, we, we can only explore to know. Um, in terms of things that, are, that we could, uh, or similar lines of research could explore in the future would be like more sort of open-ended activities, like Laura said, it was fairly constrained in the, in, the type, in, the, in terms of the type of the activity that they were engaged in, so you could potentially experiment with a lot more. But the basic, basic infrastructure for experiment, experimentation with um, activities of these kinds is already there. It could be interesting to use um, mechanical terms for like creating more knowledge. Um, Bjorn and I discussed this um, weekly last week. Um, I actually sent out a survey in the lab to sort of add to the brain of the system and we sort of filled out proper, more questions and properties. So that could be a potential solution because people can help, you know, to point out features that they could put in, that kids could potentially ask about, and you could build a build a brain and add that with the pre knowledge that you have, and have a uh, sort of a more thorough understanding of the kind of questions that they can ask. Um, and yeah, I mean the I mean the spot that we evaluated so far has been deserted, so it would be interesting to sort of evaluate the fully automated system as well. Um, so that could be a something to explore. Um, and on that note, we have Spot installed and ready to talk. It's like sitting in the other room. It's fairly restricted in strategy, but we, we could go up to it and talk to it. It is sort of prepared to do the demo. So we have put it in a loop. It doesn't uh, exhaust itself of the syllabus. So you just go up to it, um, say game, um, and it would show you the two objects. You say start, and then it would shuffle around and hide the object. Um, it has a fairly uh, sort of limited brain, as I said, constructed from like what we already know and from the surveys that we did. But see if it can ask your basic question or answer your basic question. If you have a question that's out, outside the brain of spot, let me and uh, me or Tim know, and we can actually build that in real time because it's just a property list. So we can technically add that property and the query should be able to you know, resolve itself. Um, if there are speech recognition errors, of course, let us know because um, we could potentially add that to the error list table and it would be we are sort of trying to use this gathering as a means to resolve these problems with the system so it would be good to um, and yeah I mean it uses my voice as of now so bear with us. Two questions. Yeah. Um, the the first one is in your evaluation right now, it seems like what we haven't addressed yet is for the particular object pairs you've chosen, what coverage your current lookup table gives you, right? You've, you've played, you've done the speech recognition, but on the corpus that, 
that came from your study, so you know that for those objects, you, you already had the right properties in, in your Yeah, given that you already had yeah. the and, and so it seems like there's another step that would now, with the same object pairs, would have other kids right, talk, I mean, talk with Spot yeah. and see how many of those questions are. That's very true. Yeah, I, mean, it's only, I think yeah, I think there's a point there. I mean, it's a it's a knowledge representation of the sort of the fit that you're brought with, and not necessarily of the world at large, or like the kids in the world at large. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean that is why I, we, I sort of you know did that additional route of you know circulating a survey on the same objects and trying to see like what other features can people think of. Um, yeah. And I think there are multiple such you know rounds required for it to be able to. It would be nice to be able to answer the question of how much data you need yeah. for for this particular. Right. You can also just look at like the overlap between the kids that you study and like how how much their questions overlap, right? Mm -hmm. Just to like get a guess of like okay, basically every kid asks something different, or like most kids ask something. Yeah, it's actually interesting. I actually sort of briefly looked at that. I don't, I don't think I have like sort of numbers to support it, but they're fairly. They're, they, they're fairly constrained. I mean, they're fairly like it's, a, it's sort of a pool of questions. And I think, I, I mean, I don't know, uh, Tim has more. I mean, he's, he's been looking at the data as well. So, but it, it's like a finite few set of questions they would, that they would ask generally. And then there are like some outliers where they would like have a complicated framing to think. But generally, it's like a standard set of things. Maybe there are. Maybe these objects are something that they like sort of see or talk about on a daily basis, and which is why there are like certain. Yeah. Um, certain things that they think about or talk about. But when I did the same sort of survey sort of a thing with people here in the lab, it seems like adults and kids like behave extremely differently. Because like almost all the responses I got from people here in the lab were fairly non overlap which is very interesting um, for an activity like twenty questions to do. Because you would expect that people would ask the same kind of thing. But I think kids do ask the same kind of thing. <laughs> adults don't. Um, the other, uh, yeah. yeah. My, my second question was, um, so you've, you've given us some motivation how there's this clear data that's beneficial to be exposed to more language. More language early on is better. Right? Um, is there, do you see there being any danger or downside to have a portion of that language come from an automated system that will get things wrong? Ever so often, so that you get trained on having dialogue that may not make sense if you had that same dialogue. I feel that that was the premise. I mean, I, I think that we had that in mind. That, you know, you don't want to essentially create a system that goes wrong very often, and you know, sort of, you know, gives the wrong response very often. And which is why there was, which is why I said that pre knowledge was very important, and which is why we sort of did these whole bunch of phases before we actually built even like you know, sort of part of building. System. Because we did not like just want to go like you know head on into building an automated system and then you know we take it to the field and it fails to work. Because of because a part of creating the engaging experience, I think I agree with you is to be able to answer and resolve these things correctly. Which is why I think I think whenever you're trying to build any system of this sort, there should also be a data collection phase before you can before you can actually build the automated system so that you can uh, so that you can learn from that. As a matter of fact, you would see it in the thesis. We have like two chapters, almost two chapters dedicated to experiments that we did with Chagas, um, which is a database of like speech. And we were initially trying to build something like way more open ended. But it, over a period of time, we realized that it's really, it's really, really hard. And you need a lot of content, you need a lot of data for everything to be resolved correctly. So the process was initially directed towards addressing that question. Sorry, just, I, I think you might. I think there are two things going on. Um, similar to there, and might be fun. DJ or like a wrong. I think you're talking about the mismatch of a you know, number of answer questions. So you have a sort of a list of best matches. So something is not perhaps not that accurate. Or you know, the yeah, so if you think that thing, no. Right, but it could lead to a reinforcement of incorrect. There is some language. Yeah, there is. There is some language. To sort of cater to the minimum without for instance checking the amount of time. There is a reason for that. Yeah, 
I think maybe, I mean, maybe the solution to that is maybe we can, should have like some sort of feedback as well. Like if, yeah, yeah, we could add that. I mean, it's already talking on the field, so I mean, we could potentially build that feedback. Yeah, in, in any order. <laughs> of misunderstandings or, or um, lacks of understandings of the computer of what the child says and how the child makes sense mm -hmm. of that fleet in terms of how, what does he or he do after the, the computer says what does she reformulate the question exactly I which see. implies that she perceives uh, a defect in the in the, uh, in the audience in the right. computer was that she uh, um, rephrased the question in a way that conveys that she perceived her question as inadequate. Right, right. And so, if you come across, you know, if you get a sense that there is a perception of uh, uh, the machine as uh, possibly um, undergoing problems and mm -hmm. uh, misunderstanding, mm -hmm. then I wouldn't be too worried about the machine that makes mistakes because the child would say, the machine makes mistakes rather than I'm inadequate, I'm incompetent, I have to constantly to revise my own speech to accommodate it to be able to yeah. yeah, I have some more questions uh, related to how do you feel in the number of spots? Is spot a human type or a fictional type or is part of the story? With which type of memory do you go? I mean, I can only. Um, Sort of speak from um, sort of anecdotes. I think. I mean, I think there. Are, I think there. Are, um, I looked up, looked it up a little bit, and I've thought, thought about it also, like after talking to you, because it specifically discussed this. But I think you sort of store fiction, and I mean, different parts of the brain get activated based on you know the reality of the fiction. And I think they do. I mean, they do understand the fact that Spot can answer their questions, but. Given that they have a realization of the fact that these questions are fairly constrained, I think they're, um, I don't know how to frame it, but I think they have a realistic understanding of the fact that spot is not all powerful and it has like its own capability. And it's like something that we've built and not something that exists out there. Um, and it's like, some, I mean, because when we, we met them, they sort of knew that we were doing this research and you know, this, there is this thing that we've built which is like projected into the environment. So I think the, they do realize that it is something that you know these people who are sitting in the room have built, and it is not something which is like you know real or, or exists in the world that they exist. Um, and given that it is actually projected on a wall, they actually associate with physical form very well. So for something to be real, to like you know make it a toy and give it sort of you know the form that humans have, then they might be misled. Um, but in terms of you know expectations from the system, since it was projected, I think they had an understanding of um, the fact that you know this restricted in capability it is not human and it has been built by built by us. No, yeah. But something else took me off when you said that people were really care about the fact that it's a fairly simple premise. Remind me how four year olds tell you the same goal five years ago. And they have no problem with that. And they expect you to laugh the same every time. If you don't play around with it, it's fun. It was funny at first. Yeah. So they don't understand that the state of knowledge has changed to what they're telling them. So the entire interaction of the future of the product now. And they just enjoy the fact that they play with the thing. That's true. And the outcome is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Because if they tell a joke and then we wonder what the whole joke is, then it's about the outcome. Right. And so we shift there from play to think about the world. You know, and I'm very curious at which stage in people's lives that changes. That changes, yeah.
Hmm. I think it's a it's a fairly it sounds like a PhD thesis to me. I mean, uh, it's a fairly complex question to answer because you're essentially again building things for an audience who's not used to building those things, right? So, I mean, you're I mean, people like us who have experience, like you know, building machine learning or playing games or not, or sort of you know have an understanding of how things work. Maybe for us it's easier, but being able to build talking tools is just like I mean, it's of course open to exploration. Um, and I mean, of course, when you sort of work on something like this, you always keep that in mind. Like even when I was developing the system, I sort of left some plugs in so that you could the brain of the character sort of sits outside the system. And I think that could be a good way to start. That the content that is serving your system or the content that is serving your like non-linear cinema would probably sit outside. And then, then that gives it gives it a good structure because if you're exploring any sort of mapping environment, you could just explore in that particular domain to how to create that particular mapping. And then you know this piece of work is So I think I think there should be um, sort of modularity there. Um, yeah, I mean that's I mean I can only speak from you know sort of experiences that I've had in my project. I cannot possibly like extrapolate it to stress. But I think that's how you could do it. Like, you could probably keep the knowledge outside, and then you could basically have the system. Yeah, Drew. Um, I was I was wondering like again something else. I know it's only kind of the first part of the spring. There was this rejection of the new kind of five that the machine was the slave work, and like you said, oh maybe the person on the other end would say, oh wow, this is what I've never seen before. It's a new challenge, a new thing that I have to do on this project. That's what I recommend. Now there's three questions that I was wondering if you thought out a way to mimic that kind of thing. Right, so like on the one there's sort of this confusion new new words, new experiences, etc. But the point is it's sort of like okay, well, you know, I sort of say to get the five points from my from the book to a fellow around the kind of thing. How do you get that kind of just have those two two you know options? Um uh, and then maybe have dialogue with thought about something like maybe uh spot to then have that same kind of injection to so there are a whole bunch of things there. I'll try to say a few, a few of them. Um, so I think both are important. Um, I think acquiring new, like, new, like, new knowledge is important, but I think having practice with structures that exist in your sort of knowledge base is also important. Um, and I think at, at the stage where these students are or at the sort of at, the, at that at the physical level, um, Question asking or framing questions is something that they use as a very effective tool sort of gaining new knowledge structures. So if they see a hammer and do not know what it is, they would ask questions about it. Um, and I think that's where we want to sort of contribute, sort of giving them practice with you know these ways of framing questions or you know complex tenses or statement construction, things like that. So that was the sort of the purpose. Something that I did, that I do want to clarify about the sort of the pronunciation feedback work. Was that it was not new words. Like it was words that they already see in their curriculum. So they, it was words that they see around themselves, but they don't have the opportunity to practice them. And that's where we were trying to contribute. We were trying to sort of create an environment where they would, where they would like, you know, engage in this game, talk to it freely, without like having an, anyone around them. And given that they get this continuous sort of practice with pronouncing words over and over again, um, we were trying to sort of make sure that. You know, they, Sort of move in terms of so it was not like completely new words. These are words that they have seen. They were just getting exposure in terms of working. Yeah, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>